first one in verse 14 and 15. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Eternal God, we stand before you. We lift our hands to you. And we are listening for a word from you. And we ask that your word will come today, not just where we could hear it, not just where we could read it written down, not in black and white on a page or in audio and video across a computer screen. But we pray that your word will come with power, with full conviction, and with your Holy Spirit. This is our prayer through Jesus, who lives and reigns with you as one God now and forever. Amen. Oh, praise God. Praise God for the life of Mary Cavan. The Cavan family had tons of flowers up here yesterday, honoring and celebrating her life. And they were so gracious to leave some for us today. I want to just welcome you to First Christian. If this is your first time or 1,000th time, we're really thrilled that you're here. Today, I began telling you a story about some things that I did with my kids long ago and right up to the present moment. Nathan was about three years old, and I figured that he was was now ready. He was now ready for a secret Jesus school. You see, Nathan and I, we had one day that was ours together. I had one day off from church work, and that was the day that my wife Donna worked, and so I was in charge of everything eating, feeding, sleeping, changing, whatever it would be, depending upon the age. And so when he was three, I I said, hey, Nathan, I've got a secret that I want to tell you about. It's, It's a secret that's a gift that everyone is given, but not everyone opens up. And here's what we're going to do. On Fridays, I'm going to have secret Jesus school with you. And he's like, okay, okay. Now, I didn't have to remind Nathan at all about this because Whenever he knew that it was Friday, after we ate lunch and before nap, he he could do all the reminding for me. He was excited and compelled. Now, just a little note to parents. There is a great value in anticipation. There's great value in delayed gratification, where you wait to do something. Anyway, so we get to Friday, and lunch is over, and we sit down, and I begin telling Nathan about Secret Jesus School. And what I, what I told him is that everyone in the world, whoever you are, whether you're a believer or not a believer, someone that's close to God or far away from God, all of us are in secret Jesus school. And I pointed him to the Gospel of Mark, to the, to the verses that I just read, to Mark chapter 1. And I told him about the good news of Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And he said, that's not a secret. Yeah, that's exactly right. He he was on to me, even at three years old. Of course, that's not a secret. It's not a secret in the sense that you're supposed to keep it quiet and not tell anyone. It's not that kind of a secret at all. But Mark, this shortest gospel, this oldest account of Jesus' life, tells us about Jesus. So whether we know it or believe it or want to follow it at all, this secret While it's true that it's out there and everyone can know it, the whole thing gets bottled up in this one verse from Mark, shared for us to look at. Now, Jesus is not something that you study about, even though you can do that. Jesus is not just something that you're going to as a destination. Jesus is not some person that that you're to keep from other people. Jesus is a way. Because it's pretty easy for us to look at a truth like what I just read to you, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and either say, well, I accept that or I reject it. And we kind of have this thing where it's up in our head, it's cognitive. We can think that we know something because we can recognize that it's true. And I'm not talking about that kind of recognition. I'm talking about a way of life. A way of living in the world. 
Not simply a body of knowledge that one could master, but a person who wants to live life with you. A way where you apply in the practice of your life what it looks like. All right, every one of you, whoever you are, we are all embodied souls. We are one. We don't just have a soul that's separated from us and a body that's over here. We are together as one. And Jesus shows us about God coming in the flesh and shows us how we might live. You know, in the same way that the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Jesus, God desires to live in you in a very similar way, where it's not separated, it's connected, where God wants to live your life with you. So there's a message, but there's also a life, a way of being in this world. Well, there Nathan and I are sitting on the floor. I've read that one lengthy verse about Jesus being the Son of God, And I told him that there are four things that are a part of being in Secret Jesus School. Four things that we do. And the first thing is that we pursue the life of Jesus. We are seeking to be with Jesus wherever we go. We are also presenting the very life of Jesus. His life that he expressed in the world, we're to present as well. And we also are to proclaim, we're to speak about the message of Jesus through our voice. And we proceed forward into new places, the places where Jesus calls us to go. Now, I mean, you guys know me. I'm not a preacher that's given to alliteration, right? Of pursuing and presenting and proclaiming and proceeding. You don't get from me the four steps to do anything, right? And yet, this provides something of a structure, something of a map for us. Well, you've heard it before, haven't you? That we are people who are being everywhere with Jesus. We're doing the things that Jesus did. We're saying the things that Jesus spoke about. And we're going to the places where Jesus leads us. Be, do, say, go. Is that familiar to us? And it represents for us our mission, which is what? Follow Jesus. This becomes the template, the map for what our lives are to look like. And we're always in this school. We're always learning how to live our life from Jesus. So that it's not just in our minds, but it's also in our lives and how we live. Well, the way I want to explain this today is to go to two verses. I've unpacked one of them for you that I want to spend some more time unpacking before we stuff into our knapsacks on this journey. And then I want to look at the other verse that I read to you. First, let's look at this verse one again. It's pretty easy to assume that we know this, this beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Well, we get the word beginning. We find out that we're in the middle of a story. You're in this story. It's a story that God began. You didn't create yourself. It's not something that you started. You came from someone else, whoever that might be. You might be the result of two lovers that come together. You might have been the result of a one-night stand. You might be the result of a long-term marriage. However it is, in God's grace, you've been brought and given life, and a story has begun that you had nothing to do with. And Jesus invites you to take your story, your way of living, and to attach it to Jesus, who was a human being among us. Do you know what Jesus means? It's a Hebrew word. It's, that's right, Joshua, Yeshua. There's lots of ways that it could be translated. In Hebrew, it literally means God saves. Yahweh is salvation. That's a pretty good name for for Jesus, a good meaning. But then he has this other name. He's the Christ. Now, I often will say, okay, now in the carpenter shop when Jesus was growing up, he did not get junk mail to Mr. Christ. This is not a last name. It's not a surname. It is a title. Christ, anointed one, king, Messiah. This is a designation where when Jewish ears hear it, They understand it as king, the one that they'd hoped for. Now, for the most part, Jewish ears would be tracking along so far with this. 
But when you get to the next one, son of God, well, that's just short of blasphemy. Are you kidding me? Are we calling this person the son of God, a divine person? Now, in some ways, we can all pinch ourselves and say, yes, we're daughters and sons of God. And in a way, we all are children of God. But here is a statement about Jesus being the son of God. A word that was even used in the Greek times to represent the Caesar. And yet he is a king, this carpenter Jesus, who comes and lives among us. This is a confession. It's a statement of belief where Jesus is the one through whom God will save the world. Jesus is the Messiah, the King, the Christ. And he is the Son of God that God has anointed to carry out his purposes in the world. Now, I love that, that Mark gives us the very last word first. It's not the way I prefer to watch a movie. I don't want someone to tell me how it ends. I'm not quite like a Jason Helm who will plug his ears when I talk about movies. I'm not one who likes to read the last chapter of the novel before I even get started. And yet with Mark, I'm really glad that he gives us the whole story bottled up in this one verse so that we can see where he's going and what he's about to. Because Mark doesn't tell us really who Mark is. He tells us who Jesus is. He tells us who our traveling companion is in this life. And he invites us into this life of Jesus to travel with him. Well, that's that first verse. Now what I want to do is tell you one of Jesus' entire sermons in one verse, not even a whole verse. And you're like, well, Brady, couldn't you take a lesson from Jesus? If he could do a whole sermon in one sentence... Couldn't you quit wasting our time with all these periods and exclamation points and question marks? Okay, well, give me a little break. But look in verse 15. In verse 15 of Mark chapter 1, it says, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. This is Jesus' core preaching. This is the central summary of everything he was about. Now, I don't know if you were taking notes on that sermon or if you've had enough time to fall asleep in that sermon. We certainly didn't have enough time to cue the band for an altar call. And yet there it all is. It's all there. All of the teachings, all the parables flow from this understanding that the kingdom, the reign of God had arrived and it was at hand and available to everyone. So here the gospel is contained And I'll point out before Jesus dies, the whole good news gospel is shared that God's reign has come and showed up as Jesus. It's on hand. The curtain has raised for the play. This is the big moment of the sporting event. And we are able to see that the kingdom, the reign of God is here. Now, we're not too up on kingdoms. We, We don't really like that. We like democracies. And I've told you before that a kingdom has two parts to it. It's usually a geographical terrain. It's an area over which a king has rule. And it's also a group of people over which a king has rule. So people, a populace, and a geographical realm. I really like the way Dallas Willard talks about it. That the kingdom of God is where what God wants to be done is done. That's what we're welcoming into our lives. That's what's available to us, where what God does, wants done with me will be done. Let me tell you this. I don't know who you are, but it doesn't matter whether you accept it or reject it. It's true. God's kingdom is everywhere. Our ability to say yes or no to it does not affect God in any way, shape, or form. It doesn't impact his reign or his rule. His rule is everywhere. It's kind of like the fish. You probably heard talked about the fish who says, I don't, I don't believe in the water. You know, the fish exists in this water, in this sense of God being all around it. But maybe let's just imagine this fish is rather astute says, I don't believe in the water because I can't see it. <laughs> right? Well, okay. Or maybe the fish says, I, can't, I just cannot see that God could be three in one. How could that be? God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the other fish are trying to explain and they say, well, 
Have you ever heard of H2O? Hydrogen, two parts. Oxygen, one part. That's three parts, one water. It doesn't matter whether we accept or reject. It's about our availability to God. Are we going to participate in the work that God's doing in the world? Because our lives are tied to God. Right now, as fish, we can live as, as long as we can inside of the water. God has given us graciously life. But there is no life for a fish outside of the water. Once the fish is outside of the water, it's gone. And that will be true of us unless we connect ourselves with the one who is the giver of life. Because it's similar to us as humans. We may think we can exist without God, but we can't. So, back to Jesus' sermon. Again, you're saying, Brady, you're not doing well getting this all out in one, one sentence like Jesus did. Well, the kingdom of God has come near. This reign of God is available to you. Repent and believe the good news. Repent is a word that's not originally a religious word. It's a change of mind word. It's a turn around. You're going in one direction and you make a direct U-turn. It's where you begin to think in a new way. Repentance invites us to understand that our life is focused on God's rule and not our own. No longer do we begin to make our decisions based upon our own desires or what we think is best for ourselves, but we're following Jesus, who is our King. We're renouncing evil, we're renouncing sin, and we're turning in this new direction. Repent. Turn your life around. Align yourself with the kingdom of God. Believe. Now again, that, that sounds like a church word because it's become a church word. Uh, believe is more than just something that you think. In fact, the better translation is trust. To rely upon. To really put your confidence in someone other than yourself. It's, it's where a fish stops trying to fight the water, the way reality really is constructed with God all around us and begins to trust and rely upon God who wants to spend, his, spend time in partnership with us. Now, it's easy to spend a lot of time on surface knowledge. To treat Christianity as just a bunch of facts that we learn, books that we read, confessions that we make, and it's not just that kind of knowledge that's at that surface level, that recognition or cognitive. It's at a very personal level, a personal knowledge. In fact, that's the trailhead where God is inviting you to go into business with God. And the knowledge is meant to be personal knowledge of who God is. When I sit down with Nathan, when I sit down with Lizzie over these many years, I could do some instructing on how to use money. I could pull out a whiteboard and say, this is what your checking account would look like or your savings account. This is what bills are. And that would be some kind of knowledge that I'm transferring to them. That would be a school of sorts. But what's more important is how they see me spend my money. How I spend and save money. How I pay my bills on time. It helps for them to see this in life, not in theory. Because we learn how to live life with Jesus through all that happens to us. The good things, the difficult things, the friends that are so fun to be with and the friends that take every effort and energy to help them be who they need to be. And so I can't just talk about it. They have to be able to see it in my life. And Secret Jesus School is a way of taking all of life and recognizing that there's things that God will teach us as they come. Pursuing the life of Jesus with Jesus. Presenting the life of Jesus with Jesus. Proclaiming the words that Jesus spoke and proceeding forward into the life that Jesus has. I hope you're willing to pack your bags on this journey. I, I hope you're ready. Because each week in the month of July, I'm going to be looking at each aspect of that. And I'm going to be giving very practical ways that you can think about your household, your home, and how you might think about entering into this secret life of Jesus. 
Now, you don't have to pack a lot. In fact, I've just given you two verses. It's not exactly a very thick travel guide, now is it? It's not like one of those Zomers guides. It's more not even a brochure that you might pick up at, a, at an activity or an entry that you would go into. It's, it's almost like a post-it night note of Mark chapter 1, verse 1, and Mark chapter 1, verse 15. A title to a book and an entire sermon that Jesus preached. So I hope you'll dig in. I hope you'll want to walk with us in this way. I'll be happy to be your guide. But I'm going to be pointing to Mark and more specifically to Jesus.